Hello, everybody. Welcome to our next installment of The Return of the Divine Sophia. Um, today, we're going to be reading Chapter 8, Footprints of the Mother. If this is your first time here on the channel, as always, welcome. I'm so happy you're here, and I'm really happy that you're interested in this topic that we're exploring, which is really The Return of the Divine Feminine. Of course, if this is your first time, I would suggest starting with Part 1 down in the description box below in both rumble and youtube there will be a link to that playlist so you can start from the very beginning all right so if you're with me and you've got your own book copy then we're going to be starting on page 142 again this is chapter eight footprints of the mother humanity has imagined her as the immensity of cosmic space as the moon as the earth and nature she is the age-old symbol of invisible dimensions of soul and the ins instinctive intelligence that informs it we live within her being, yet we know almost nothing about her. She is everything that is still unfathomed by us about the nature of the universe, matter, and the invisible energy that circulates through all the different aspects of her being. She spins and weaves the shimmering robe of life in which we live and through which we are connected to all cosmic life. Andrew Harvey and Anne Barron, the Divine Feminine. As I entered more deeply into an understanding of these mysteries, over the next few years, I was to learn about a completely different type of human history from what we were taught about in school today. Through the writings of brave pioneers, such as archeological Marija Gambudas and Alexander Marshak, historians Barbara Walker, Rand Esler, and Merlin Stone, international authors Andrew Harvey and Ann Baring, and ceremonial teacher Z Budapest, I learned that for hundreds of years, our modern society has been a victim of a political and religious cover-up designed to conceal a time when human beings lived in a more egalitarian and humane societies. Before the warmongering ages of the patriarch descended, there were earlier eras on this planet that honored the Divine Mother as the creatrix of all life. These societies had a completely different par paradigm for human partnership from what we have today. And before we go on any further, something I forgot to do at the beginning, which I think is really important because as we know, the powers that be don't want us talking about this. So I'm going to ask, I'm going to call in Michael and Gabriel and all of my guides that are here for my highest good and for all of the people's watching's highest good to be present right now to make sure that this recording device is working, to make sure that the audio and the video line up together. I ask that any beings, whether they be human or otherwise, that are here at this moment trying to stop this, I ask that they be removed right now. I do not consent to them being here to interrupt this reading. And again, I ask that my guides, especially Michael and Gabriel, be here to protect this recording. All right. Merlin Stone, author of the seminal book, When God Was a Woman in Ancient Mirrors of Womanhood, writes, in prehistoric and early historic periods of human development, Religions existed in which people revered their supreme creator as female, the great goddess, the divine ascentrist, and be worshipped from the beginnings of the Neolithic period of 7000 BC until the closing of the last goddess temple about AD 500. Some authorities would extend goddess worship as far into the past as the upper Paleolithic age about, of about 25,000 BC. Archaeological, mythological, and historical evidence all reveal that the female religion, far from naturally fading away, was the victim of centuries of continual persecution and suppression by the advocates of the newer religions which held male deity as supreme. And from these new religions came the creation myth of Adam and Eve and the tales of the lost paradise. This hidden era of Earth's culture stretched back for literally thousands of years and encompassed great civilizations in the Middle East, the Mediterranean, Egypt, Africa, India, Britain, Polynesia, Europe, and North and South and Central American continents, all of which had once honored the Great Mother as the creatress of all. In time, I came to realize that most of these inequities we find in our world today are direct result of the, this forgotten aspect of the Queens of Heaven which set us on a course that threw our core values and ourselves out of balance. Our male-dominated approach has led to the rape and pillage of our planet's resources, the creation of hierarchical financial institutions that oppresses the poor and supports the rich, 
and the clear sense that we are losing touch with our true place in the cosmos. I can absolutely agree with this. But once again, as I've said in many, many, many of these episodes, I even though I'm reading it's patriarchal as they've written it, I don't believe it's a patriarchal society that we've come, we've been in. It's a Luciferian one. Again, that's because when you take away the divine feminine, you also take away the divine masculine. The two cannot live without each other. They, they're in perfect balance with each other. And so when you strip the divine feminine, you also strip the divine masculine. And so neither have been active. It's been patriarchal because it's Luciferian, right? And so when we bring the divine feminine back into the mix, into society, we're also going to heal and bring back the divine masculine as well. All right. For although many of us have had an innate sense, even a long buried memory of a time when men and women lived together in mutual respect and harmony, much of the history, religion, and values we have inherited have been written by the victors of a patriarchal war, war who have felt highly threatened by the true events of our ancestral past. As I began to discover these hidden records, I was stunned to see how far back they went. Barbara Moore and Sonia Sojo, authors of The Great Cosmic Mother, explain the magnitude of the lost centuries of human history. It is important for us as human beings to really grasp the time dimensions involved here. That God was considered female for at least the first 200,000 years of human life on Earth. And in fact, the only image of the creator ever painted on rock, on rock, excuse me, carved in stone or sculpted in clay for a period of about 30,000 years was that of the divine mother. While this statement seems almost incomprehensible to those of us raised in conventional contemporary societies, once we examine the anthropological evidence, it becomes an indisputable truth. In a world where we all have been conditioned to expect violence, war, and competition as the norm, few of us can even conceive of a planet where human beings can live side by side in harmony with one another. So how did this imbalance come about? How did the patriarchy gain power? And how does half of the human race claim the right to suppress or belittle the other half? What happened to our understanding of the universe, which led to one sex being forced into subservience, while the other half claims to be superior? Why are the only role models that we have of women in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam the obedient virgin and penitent prostitute or the innocent Eve who has been blamed for humankind's expulsion from paradise. Inculcating these kinds of limited archetypes sends a message to women everywhere that if they stay away from the conventions established by men, they will be either condemned or cast out of society. So I began to examine the archaeological evidence of more ancient cultures where men and women had lived together in harmony. Let's take a look at the data that supports this hypothesis and its implications for contemporary life. You know, it's so funny. She's talking about women in Judaism and Christianity. I've always had a little bit of a problem with Esther, even though I love the line from the book of Esther where it says, perhaps you were born for such a time as this. I think it's a very true line. But I remember being in Sunday school and learning about Esther and how the king's first wife like, was banished from the kingdom because she wouldn't submit to her husband. Now, as an adult, I understand what that meant. Like, she wouldn't have sex with him. She said no. And so she was banished. And Eve came along and was like, yes, master. Yes, sir. Of course, honey, coming up. And so we we're supposed to venerate. Uh, yes, I think I said Eve. Esther. Esther came along and was like, yes, master, I'll, I'll do it for you. I'll, you know, she was a subservient one. And we're supposed to venerate her as women, but not the queen that said, no, I don't want to do that with you right now. Right? It's kind of fucked up, isn't it? So I get it. I get what she's saying here. The world of archaeological evidence. One of the first people to discover the evidence for goddess-based culture was archaeological Marja Gimbutas. I hope I said that right. I probably didn't, but I'm trying my best. Raised in Lithuania, Gimbutas studied in Austria, Germany, and finally the United States. She became a graduate fellow at Harvard University in 1950, where she taught for 12 years. In 1963, she moved to the University of California at Los Angeles. And in 1967, she began her own archaeological excavations in Yugoslavia, Greece, Italy. These lasted for 15 years. Having been raised in the old country of the Lithuanian countryside, where the culture was not completely Christianized until the 14th century, 
She had grown up with many symbols still present of the ancient mother religion that once existed in her own country. This has prompted her to become a folklore specialist and a linguist fluent in more than 25 language. Holy shit. I mean, I can speak Sanskrit and English. I know a little bit of like Creole, just a little bit, which is like a form of French, but it's not like the French French, it's Creole. And of course, redneck. I can understand redneck. But 25 language, damn, that's uh, there are people that definitely have a I know somebody, we have there's a student at AYA that is picks up languages very, very easily, very easily. And people, some people just have a, a gift for that. So unlike her American-born colleagues, Gimbutas had an intimate understanding of the symbolic ling- language of the goddess that she had learned in childhood. Between the year of 1967 and 1980, she was a project director at five major Neolith- Neo- Neolithic digs in the southeastern Europe. During the many years of her excavations in the Mediterranean, particularly Greece, Bulgaria, Yugoslavia, and Turkey, Gambuda's teams began turning up artifacts that represented the Divine Mother, and Gambudas was able to interpret them. Circles, spirals, vulvas, snakes, birds, fish, wavy lines, and labyrinths were all present on walls, floors, and pottery that they had found, as well as numerous Venus-like figures. Gambudas recognized all of these as part of an inter- 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 intricate, that's the word, intricate, symbol language once used by her ancestors linked to the idea of the feminine creator. Her understanding of this symbol system created a bridge between archaeology and mythology as she came to the conclusion that the old art of of Europe reflected a a mythopoetic perception of the sacredness and mystery of the natural world expressed a cohesive and persistent ideological system. During the course of her many excavations, she discovered images of the Great Mother going back well beyond 35,000 years. These discoveries were first brought to light in 1974 with the publication of her celebrated book, Goddess and Gods of Old Europe, BC, sorry, Gods and Goddesses of Old Europe, uh, 6500 to 3500 BC, Myths and Cult Images, Gambuda went on to publish several more books on the subject, including The Living Goddess, The Language of the Goddess, The Civil- Civilization of the Goddess, The World of Old Europe, and The Bronze Age Cultures in Central and Eastern Europe. The Culture of the Goddess. In her books, Dr. Gambudas reveals that, there, that these earlier militaristic cultures lived in balance both with one another and with the land. They cultivated healthy male and female relationships which resulted in peaceful agrarian societies of craftsmanship, ritual art, and the renewal of the earth. The reins of leadership were usually held by a woman who was both a queen and high priestess, and her brother or husband often ruled beside her. The lines of succession and property were usually passed through the mother's line, while the uncle or husband helped to train the next generation and rule beside her. While a man can certainly have merit, skill, and status in his own right, it was his marriage to the queen, the sovereign of the land, that granted him kingship. As a general rule, society was built around the women. Even on the highest levels where a descent was through a female line, a man became king or chieftain only by a formal marriage to his daughter, not his son, succeeded to the next chieftain was the youth who married his daughter. Metristic goddess cultures were always associated with the cultivation of food and the agriculture knowledge of herbs, roots, plants, and healing and other medical aids. That's something that we talk about a lot on this channel. As well as the invention of writing, arts, weaving textiles, and the very foundation of civilization itself. Among their many advanced achievements were pottery, weaving, writing, complex calen- calendrical and mathematical systems, astronomy and astrology, painting, basket making, domestication of animals, cultivation of grains and seas, masonry, and sacred architect. They were keepers of story, history, and sacred rites, and they also maintained temples of worship that honored the sacred in all things. The priestesses long presided over religious practices. Woman was the natural intermediary Woman was the natural intermediary with divinity, the greatest of whom was woman defined. The participation of men and the cult was, like the associated association of gods with goddesses, a late development. Well, that makes sense because the woman's body herself is a portal, right? 
you're, you have, if you have a womb, you have a portal. You're literally, even if you decide to never have kids, you have the ability to allow a soul come in and through your body to come into third density. You're a freaking portal. So that made sense that the divine feminine is the two intuitive art so that women have more of a connection to the other side of the veil because your body is literally a portal. Their part in religious ceremonies was always as a subordinate one, even when the king became the highest priest of the bull. In these communities, no weapons have been unearthed, no defensive earthworks found, and there is no evidence of an oppressive ruling hierarchical or social conflict. This societal model of balance between husband and wives or brothers and sisters is what anthropologists now call a partnership model. This is quite different from the dominant patriarchal cultures we have been living under for the past 2,500 years. These harmonious societies of shared leadership resulted in centuries of prosperous agrarian societies and virtually no war. In their excavations, anthropologists have found streets lined with spacious homes in towns of several thousand inhabitants where there were no tribal gods, only a universally worshiped mother goddess or god goddess creator that expressed the principles of male and female union. While some of these statues were created solely in the voluptuous image of the divine mother, others show a round female body and a narrow pear-like head of a man. In other words, a creator of balanced androgyny. The key finding is that women participated as fully as the men in all aspects of their religious and intellectual life with equal authority and creativity. Women played essential roles in religious rituals and acted as partners in evolving the spiritual philosophy on which their civilization was built. Not until the invasion of the patriarchal Kurgan people from the north imposed male dominance on the populace, bringing war and national power struggles to the region and competing gods to their temples, did the men and women of old Europe demonstrate an antagonism and disunity. Until they had appeared to have built a framework and evolved the structural principles of their societies together with great success, each modifying and balancing the extreme tendencies of the other. In essence, we are talking about a partnership model that is quite different from the dominator model we have had for some 2,500 years. Marija Gimbutas explains the difference between these two kinds of civilization in their use of symbolic language revealed some 50 years after her archaeological excavations. The symbolic systems are very different. All of this reflects the social structure. The Indo-European social structure is patriarchal, patrilineal, and the psyche is warrior. Every god is also a warrior. The three main, main Indo-European gods are the god of the shining sky, the god of the underworld, and the thunder god. The female goddesses are just brides, wives, or maidens without any power, without any creativity. They're just there. Their beauties, their Venuses, like the dawn or a sun maiden. So the symbol of what existed in the matriistic cultures before the Indo-Europeans in Europe is totally different. I call it matriistic, not matriarchal, because matriarchal always arouses ideas of dominance and is compared with patriarchal. But it was a balanced society. It was not that women were really so powerful that they usurped everything that was masculine. Men were in their rightful positions. They were doing their own work. They had their duties and they also had their own power. This is reflected in their symbols where you find not only goddesses, but also gods. The goddesses were creatrix. They are creating from themselves. As far back as 35,000 BC, from symbols and sculptures, we can see that parts of the female body were creative parts, breasts, belly, and buttocks. It was a different view from ours. It had nothing to do with pornography. And that's interesting because even in, in India, you see the female goddesses are always depicted as, as being very voluptuous. They have really big boobs and like tiny waist and, you know, it's very female, right? So that's interesting. She's talking about that. Today's researchers in this area are beginning to realize that many of our social, political, and economic problems have been created because of this more aggressive winner-take-all dominator model. These problems include the classic triangle of the persecutor, rescuer, and victim mentality that are often generated by the power of caste, hierarchy, abuse, and oppression. 
Scientist James DeMoyo says there are no clear and unambiguous evidence for the existence of warfare, sadism, traumatization of babies, subordinates of, wi of women, nor any of the trappings of patriotism everywhere in the world prior to 4000 BCE, none. Which makes sense because we know, from what I understand, Lumeria, which happened before Atlantis, Lumeria was the time before confusion. Then Atlantis came in and then there was confusion. My dog just came home. He was out. And he just came home and ran in to say hey to me. See, probably wants to hate everybody. Who is the hate to everybody? Say hey to everybody. He's a mama's boy. All right. And since this patriarchal model has been the mindset that has generated the problem, these imbalances in our thinking and cultural cannot be resolved by using the same model. We can only heal our society if we are willing to make a paradigm shift in the coming ages to a collective life of greater cooperation. Statues of the goddess. During her many years of research, Dr. Again Buddhist discovered many of the ancient statues of the Divine Mother, the earliest of which is the figure called the Acheulean goddess. I hope again I'm saying that right, the Acheulean goddess. This hand sized statue is dated somewhere between 230,000 and 800,000 years ago and was discovered in the Golan Heights region of Israel, once known as Barakat Ram. Carved from scoria stone, it was found in organic matter and has now been carbon dated to at least two, 232,000 years ago, and many, in fact, be far older. The Archulian goddess is one of over 130 such statues that have been recovered to date and is believed to come from an area inhabited by a, a, a hominid tribe that predates even the Neanderthals. This tells us that over 200,000 years ago, our ancestors believed that God was a female, one who birthed the universe. Now, I'll say again, just to remind you guys, as far as like the historical timeline she's presenting, I don't actually agree with a lot of like the Neanderthal stuff at all. I am following the Tartarian stuff, and I, I don't believe that we came from monkeys at all. I think that's, um, I used to, I used to believe in evolution. I don't anymore. Um, but, but I just, I'm reading what she's giving us. And I do think that though, a lot of this does prove Lumeria and uh, Atlantis in some way. So, all right. Some researchers have called this powerful figurine the earliest manifest manifestation of art of work. Before the discovery of the Archulian goddess, the earliest known statue of the divine mother was the Venus of Will Willendorf, a voluptuous female figure only four and three eighths inches high carved out of bone and known to be about 40,000 years old found in 1908 in Austria near the Danube river by archeologist Joseph Sumbathi. The Willendorf goddess is one of the several powerful images represent representing and revering the fertility of the great mother. Some of these figures also resemble the many figures of the goddess found throughout the Near East, especially in Lebanon, Syria, Palestine, Anatolia, now modern-day Turkey, Iraq, and Jericho. These goddess figurines also appear in Australia, China, Africa, Sumeria, Turkey, and Egypt, and continue to be discovered even today, dating back between 24,000 and 18,000 BCE. Whew, I know I'm going to say this word wrong, so I'll, I'll put this word up on the screen. <laughs> In the ruins of Kat Katalahoyuk, Turkey, for example, there are hundreds of female figurines found all over the site, as well as the goddess symbols painted on the walls, including artistically drawn cow heads that clearly resemble the organs of female reproduction. We also know that Hathor, um, the teacher of Isis in Egypt, was noted by a cow head. Interestingly enough, the woman and the children also buried inside the city while the men were buried outside of it. Similarly, an ancient Chinese city dated to 7500 BCE, archaeologists have found a female spirit temple clearly marked as such in the ancient Chinese characters. It altars still have seeds on them that when planted germinate into plants even today. Finally, no discussion of goddess carvings would be complete without including the Laocell goddess. Again, I hope I'm saying that right. This carving was found over the entrance to a cave of initiation in the Dorgon region of La Salle, France, not far from the Lascaux Caves. Can 
my French, my real French is terrible. So forgive me. Inside this caves are images of a tantric sex sexual couple, as well as birthing images of the goddess with the male consort. The Venus herself is a voluptuous figure who points to her pregnant tummy with one hand and holds a sickle moon with 13 lunar notches marked on it in the other. It's interesting, 13 lunar notches, because, I mean, astrology mostly follows the sun, but we know there's like 13, not 12, so that's interesting. I, I don't know, just, just interesting. In addition, these images dating back to the uh, Paleolithic era clearly reveal that our ancestors understood that reproduction occurs through sexual union of a man and woman. No shit. <laughs> I would agree. I think our ancestors understood that. Hence, well, why we're here today. So you're the result of an orgasm, basically. So I, I, I'm glad our ancestors figured that out. So, so while the goddess was the in, in, initiator of these mysteries, revealed in her image over the doorway, the male is honored as the consort of the goddess. The goddess of Lesbul was discovered in 1911 by J.G. Lalane. In the carving above the cave's entrance, the figure holds a horn in her hand, a symbol long linked to the all-pervading mother goddess of Mesopotamia, Egypt, Crete, and India. This is linked to the sacred cow, a symbol that was connected to both Hathor or Isis in ancient e Egypt, yeah, just like I said, Inanna in Sumeria, Adida in India, and Asherah by the Jews. The sickle half-moon of the horse she holds become the chalice of the, of the creation, the womb from which all things are born. Throughout the world, the moon has long been linked to many female deities, including Diana, Artemis, Aphrodite, Mary, Isis, Selene, Hera, and Juna, all of whom were once called the queens of heaven. Now, again, we, and, um, and sorry, my dog's being a little loud, so if you hear that noise over there, that's him. Now, again, in, in, in traditional yoga, we call, we know the aponic energy, the mood energy is feminine, while the pranic energy, the sun energy is masculine, as they're saying here, women do follow a lunar calendar, we get our periods once a month. So we follow the moon. So like I'm on a full moon. So every time there's a full moon, that's when I get my cycle. Um, a lot of women follow the new moon, men, I believe they get their cycles every three months with the solar, uh, where they just get a little moody, moody and hormonal. But yeah, and we call it so when you're on your period in traditional yoga, you don't practice for like two, the first two or three days when your uterus is contracting, you let it detox. And so we call that your personal moon days. Like for a woman, when is your moon day? Meaning when is your cycle? Symbols of the goddess. During her many years of research, Dr. Gambudis came to understand that throughout all of Neolithic Europe, a shorthand script of ideograms were being used to signify the presence of a divinity that was uniquely feminine. She separated these sim symbols into various categories, representing water and rain, the moon and archaeological cycles, and the continuous rotation of life itself. Like the spiral motion of the galaxy, these were the portals of rebirth, while zigzags and meanders were associated with the oscillating energy of the Holy Spirit on which all sound and light travels. The Hebrews called this undulating wave form the Shekinah, the feminine spirit of God. Christians call it the Holy Spirit. Spirit, a ruach, which literally means wind, is feminine in Hebrew, and its symbol is the dove, another image long connected with the goddess in cultures around the world. In the New Testament, we read about the dove descending on Jesus at his baptism, given the blessings of the Holy Spirit. Yet long before Christianity, the dove symbolized Isis, Aphrodite, and Ishtar, all of whom represented Mater Magna, or Great Mother. This was true across the Aegean and even the Mayan ruins at U U Umexal in Mexico and had a house of doves. Histor historically, the dove and the serpent were both linked to the Holy Mother, a fact that Jesus doubtlessly understood when he coupled these animals together in the abomination. May, yet, may ye be gentle as dove and wise as serpents, Matthew 10, 16 indicating a far older meaning behind both of these hermetic emblems. Gimbutas developed a novel interdisciplinary approach she called archaeomythology, which combines archaeology, linguistics, historical ethnology, mythology, folklore, and comparative religion. 
She discovered symbols of the goddess that include the four quarters of the world, the fish, the great cosmic egg, all aspects of gestation and new life. The fish is in the Ichithes, taught by Jesus to his students, represented the portal from which we are all born. This almond-shaped symbol is the shape of the Visica Pisces, formed through the merging of the male and female circles to create a perfect portal through which spirit can enter the world of matter. It is also the seed symbol of creation. That is why this is the shape of all seeds, a woman's yoni and the end of a man's phallus from which the seed of life emerges. When turned horizontal, the Visica Pisces becomes the eye of Ra or Horus, the opening of the inner light, which represents awakening of the spiritual sight. All of these symbols are linked to the continual circle of life and death and renewal and were instinctively connected to the ancient world of the great goddess herself. And so I'm going to go show you. So we all know the Jesus fish. We see that. And we know that the fish has been very much misrepresentation misrepresented in, um, in Christianity. They say it's because Jesus said be a fisher of men. No, she's explaining the actual meaning of that behind that. And then this is the Vesica Pisces. We spoke about that in um, when we did Megan Watterson's book as well. All right. And again, the God of, of or the Eye of Horus, guys, we know that the controllers use the Eye of Horus, but it doesn't mean it's bad, right? Every, again, everything's created by the light. The darkness stills it and inverts it. The Eye of Horus is a good thing. We need to take it back. We need to reclaim it. Yeah, the great mother of all. Anthropologist Marcelli Alady, author of the book From Primitives to Zen, is known for her worldwide perspective on shamanic indigenous culture. Dr. Lady writes, the first peoples of earth saw the great mother as the source of all nourishment, protection, power, and mystery. She was both the mother of birth and the queen of the dead. Consequently, their greatest initiations were held in the caves or clefts that were entry points to the earth's body. Birth, life, and death, and rebirth were all attributed to her, and burial and entombment were symbolical prayer for rebirth. The deceased person was laid into a grave in a fetal position as if being returned to the womb of the earth to be reborn. I like that. It's powerful. Later, Megalithic ages found the villagers chiseling out porthole tombs for the same purpose, just like the caves where Jesus and Lazarus were laid to rest. These represented the mother's womb, and in some cultures, like the Celts of Scotland, the word cave, wamba, is almost the same as the word for womb, wame. Throughout the ancient world, caves were used as places of initiation, as both male and female shamans pulled back the veils to commune with the other side. The same connection is made in the entombment rites in the Valley of Kings in Egypt. Large cabins were dug out of the mountains, and at the entrance to the tombs were painted images of Newt, the mother of the Cosmo. Newt's star-filled body stretched across the walls to the innermost chambers. It was thought that she and she alone had the power to escort the soul through the afterlife, just as today many Christians hope that Jesus will take them home into heaven. And it's interesting. Um, if you're following along with our shadow work series with Emmy and Stephanie, I've talked a lot about the Hatha Yoga Pradikapa. And one of the last episodes, I talked about how the Hatha Yoga Pradikapa, which is a manual on how to practice yoga. They talk about how the entrance of your yoga shala, the door should be low. So you bow before God before coming in. But a lot of times what I didn't mention, and it's come up here, is that these original shalas were in caves. They were in mountain caves. Now we know why goddess of the cosmos in the hero with a thousand faces joseph campbell writes the mythological figure of the universal mother imputes to the cosmos the feminine attributes of the first nourishing and protective presence in the tantric book of medieval and modern india the abode of the goddess is called Man mandvipa the island of jewels campbell goes on her conch and throne is there in a grove filled with wish-filling trees. The beach of the isle are golden sand. They are laved by the still waters of the ocean of the nectar of immortality. The goddess is red with the fire of light, the earth, the solar system, the galaxies of far extending space all swell within her womb. For she is the world cretex, ever mother, ever virgin. She encompasses the encompassing, nourishes the nourishing, and is the life of everything that lives. 
She is also the death of everything that dies. The whole round of existence is accomplished within her sway. She is the womb and the tomb. Thus, she unites the good and the bad, exhibiting the two modes of the remembered mother, not as personal only, but as universal. He saw its theology called Gaia, the deep-breasted earth, the firm seat of all things forever, who after emerging out of an ocean of chaos, brought forth the sky, the mountains, and the sea. A sanctuary of Gaia stood near the entrance of the Ac Acropolis in Athens and also in the Olympia, the site of the annual Olympic Games. Romans worshipped her as Terra Mater, the great mother earth, and her symbols were perennially linked to the healing waters of the cosmic ocean. One of her symbols was the undulating sea serpent upon which the universe floats. And today the images of Kuan Yin, Mary, and Isis are sometimes shown riding on the back of a cosmic dragon. We talked about the dragons in the Sophia Code. Springs, pools, and fountains were dedicated to the Great Mother, stretching from Sumeria to Asia, Palestine to Rome. She was Sulis Minerva in Britain, goddess of the healing waters, and today her centers can still be found in the city of Bath. In Cyprus, Greece, and Turkey, she was Aphrodite, who rose from the cosmic waters at the beginning of time. Isis, Mary, and Kuan Yin all sail upon the great ocean, and each of them was in turn called the Queen of Heaven, Mistress of the Oceans, and Star of the Sea lady of the animals. In Paleolithic cultures, the life-giving nature of the mother has long been linked to animals who regarded her as, who were regarded as her children. The Latin poet Lucretius writes, she alone is called great mother of the gods and mother of the wild beast and maker of our bodies. These more balanced cultures believe that all things have a right to life, animals, forest, birds, and swimming creatures. I agree with that. I absolutely agree with that. But in a superior patriarchal system, we are told to subdue the earth and to have dominion over the fish of the sea, fowl of the air, and over every living thing that has moved upon the earth, Genesis 1.28. However, in egalitarian societies, all creatures were seen as an expression of mother's regenerative powers. Each is important to the circle of life or everyone will perish. I, I never like that. I hate when... I think it's kind of psychopathic, actually, when Christians are like, animals are here for us. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're not here for us. We're here to protect them. They're God's creatures, too. God has just as much love for the wild beast of the woods as he does for you. Get over yourself, Christians. God knows every hair on your dog's head, just like he knows every hair on your head. God spent just as much time designing the elephant as he did designing you as Yahshua says in the gospel of the holy 12th do they not breathe the same air that you breathe shamans priestesses and medicine people dreamed with the animals listened to the invisible rhythms of the earth even today brazilian medic people tell us that because their trees and animals are being destroyed the elders can no longer dream that's why they cut off our hair too our hair is part of our psychic abilities and our antenna. It's how we know direction. It's our hair. I think that's why men bald. Um, I don't think men are supposed to bald. I, I really don't. And I know like you look at your, I know that gene comes through your mother. So like my dad has a thick head of hair. So if I ever have a son, he's going to have a thick head of hair. My nephew is going to have a thick head of hair. But I think men who bald, I think that's something coming from the controllers because our hair is very spiritual very spiritual. Without dreaming, the tribe loses its direction. Only their animals, which belong to their native forest, can give them the right to dream. The animals are our brothers. Joshua said that in the gospel of the Holy 12 as well. He said, are they not your brothers and sisters? So let's read that again. The animals are our brothers. The rivers are our veins. They run with our blood. If you block them and dam them, you stop the flowing of blood in our veins. And then that stops the heart. The Roman Diana, the Greek Ar Armetis, was the lady of wild things, the keeper of the forest. The emblem was the stag. Rion and Epona were linked to the white horses of Britain. And Hera was a symbol symbolized by the royal peacock in the Ibis deer. As Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom, she was synonymous with the owl, the clairvoyant, who was able to see what others can't. In Asia, the goddess Lakshmi, protectress of home and fortune, is flanked by two mighty elephants who shower her with life renewing water. 
And as Isis in Egypt, she was symbolized by the graceful soaring kite, a bird similar to her husband's sharp-eyed falcon. And yes, the owl does see in the dark. It can see what others can't. That's why the controllers use it as their symbol, as the, the illuminate to be able to see in the dark. Doesn't mean the owl is bad. Doesn't mean the owl is bad. Remember, God created the owl. They stole it and inverted it. We're going to be freeing up the owl, the goat, the snake, all these animals that have been used as symbols for the dark players too, that they stole. We're going to free them as well. And I personally love goats. Goats are hysterical. Three animals in particular were most sacred to the great mother, the lion, the cow, and the serpent. In Egypt, Shechemet and Bast had the lion's head, while Freya drove a chariot pulled by cats in Norse culture. Cybele, the Greek goddess of Rome, was often shown flanked by lions that drew her golden chariot in the city of, here we go again, Catalopuk. In modern day Turkey, going back to 7,000 BCE, there's a shrine wall that depicts the goddess sitting on her throne flanked by two leopards. These leopards were said to have sat beside her when people came for justice and would growl if they smelled the fear of those who lied, helping the queen to render fair judgment. Even So they were like a, a lie detector test back in the day. Even the Egyptian name for a cat was Manu, not only as an... A, Not only as an imitation of meow, but a derivative of the mother symbol ma. The cow was very sacred to the ancient mother. From the Isle of Crete to the sanctuaries of Egypt, the temple of the goddesses were often adorned with crescent horns because this symbolized or this symbol resembled the shape of the fallopian tubes and the uterus of, of a woman's reproductive system. Like the symbol of the moon, the horns of the cow held endless possibilities as the generated chalice of rebirth. I can see that. I mean, we see here the picture of Hathor has the cow head and we see the uterus that that very much looks like a cow horn, right? We also know it's the, the onk as well. It's the onk too. In Sumeria, this harg and... and Inanna were referred to as the great cows who brought milk and honey to humankind. According to Hindu mythology, all gods and goddesses reside in the body of a cow. Yeah. The Indian name for cow is Gomata, which contains the seed symbol for the mother Ma. The cow is associated with many great divinities, including Lakshmish, the mother of compassion, as well as the great avatar Krishna and his wife Sita. And uh, Gomugazana, that's a cow pose of, of asana. Do not say cow pose. It's Gomugazana is the cow pose of, of the, that's the cow, Gomugazana. And I know, and I've talked about this in India before, when you're in India, um, cows roam free, just like dogs and cats do. And so you have cows like walking down the street. Um, and a lot of people put puja marks on them as well. So um, cows are very sacred. All right. In Native American culture, the cow is honored as white buffalo, calf woman, a goddess figure who came to earth to teach the balance between animals, rocks, trees, and humans, reminding human beings of our place in the eternal circle of life. The serpent of enlightenment. The serpent represents the kundalini life force of the universe linked to the changing cycles of time. The Mayans thought of the Milky Way as the long horizontal serpent with a head on either end. The helical rising of the serpent's head occurs in the first week of August, a time once sacred to Isis. The helical setting occurs at Candlemas on February 2nd, another of the eight holy high days of the calendar year. In her circular form, she is the Ouroboros, the snake biting its tail, a symbol of the endless rounds of time as one age ends and another begins. She is one who turns the galaxy and has the power to shed her skin and to be reborn. The kundalini is also connected to the goddess energies found coiled at the base of the spine. The kundalini life force is not only activated in sexual relationships and in giving birth, but is fundamental to enlightenment. It can also be activated through just your own yoga practice too. The snake and its abstract derivatives, the spiral, are the dominant motifs of the art of old Europe writes Dr. Gambudis, reminding us that throughout Mesopotamia, the statues of the goddess have been 
found holding two snakes in her hand. These two serpents represent the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system, ruling the consciousness and automatic functions that allow the Kundalini to rise to the top of the head and awaken our inner sight. In Egypt, this snake was the cobra goddess Uchabutu, as symbolizing the original chi force of creation. Serpents are also linked to Ashira, the Hebrew mother goddess, Athena, the Greek goddess of wisdom, and the oracles of Delphi in Greece and in Egypt. In some temples, in some temple precincts, serpents were even kept at the temple and closed as a way of staying attuned to Earth's currents. Snakes are also highly sensitive to the telurgic energies of Earth, and their activities can be used to predict coming earthquakes. Since the original temples of the ancient world were deliberately mapped on key geodesic points or ley lines, this constant attunement to their energies allowed the electromagnetic energies of the Earth to be harnessed as a conduit between heaven and Earth. At the Oracle of Delphi, the priestess who entered these altered states to prophesize were called Pythias, a derivative of Python, telling us that they had learned to lift their kundalini energies into their spiritual eye. We find the same enlightened serpent rising up the shield of Athena, the goddess of wisdom in ancient Rome. Researchers had even suggested that through the use of venom, the Oracle priestesses were able to enter the trance-like state, giving them access to these other realms. Later, this serpent symbol symbology representing spiritual wisdom would be reversed in the Hebrew story of the Garden of Eden. Echoes of this reversal can be seen in the tales of Zeus, who slays the serpent Siphon, or the killing of the python by Apollo. We also see it in the destruction of the serpent laden by Hercules and Jehovah's killing of Levethian, a sea monster with many heads. Ironically, Ladon was said to have guarded the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Hera, the mother of the gods giving us clues to how our old testament accounts have been disordered over time and i told you guys my theory on the garden of eden just after reading the apocryphon books and the missing books of the bible i think it's all metaphor anyway um especially since we know the changing of timelines they wouldn't have been the only humans um my view of this is that they say that eve came from adam's rib and so that tells me metaphorically that they were twin flames Oh, different bodies, same soul, the divine feminine, the divine masculine. They were taken into prison by Lucifer into the Garden of Eden. They could not get out. By Eve's own awakening, eating from the tree of knowledge, that's the serpent awakening, and her sexual intimacy with her twin flame is what liberated them mentally from the Garden of Eden. That's kind of what I'm leading towards now with the Garden of Eden story. Um, just after reading the missing books of the Bible. It's not what they tell us it is at church at all. But I think we know that right now, right? The church is one of the biggest liars in the world. Like they're pathological liars at this point. Like nothing the church tells you is true. They're all pathological, psychotic liars. All right. Glimmers of the snake's origin meaning can be found in the worldwide emblem for healing. This good serpent also appears in the story of Moses and his serpent staff, which we know Moses wasn't a good guy, a symbol of spiritual power. Yes, because Moses stole all his spiritual power from the Egyptians. It's in the missing books of the Bible, as well as the Ak Moses tablet. So if you read the sixth and seventh book of Moses and the Ak Moses tablet, you hear the true story of Moses. Likewise, we have drawings of the father of ancient healing who had a staff with a single serpent coiled around it, indicative of initiation and health. These stories allow us to peek behind the veils to see that the snake was once a powerful symbol of wisdom before its meaning was corrupted. According to the Dartmouth Bible, a slightly abridged version of the King James Bible, the Ark of the Covenant, which was kept in the Holy of Holies in King Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, was originally held the brazen serpent staff of Moses. This was the staff that had guided the Jews out of Egypt, and it had a serpent coiled around its length, representing the kundalini forces of enlightenment as they traveled up the spine. Yes, which is the um, obelisk as well, is that, that spine. Now, again, we know that all of whatever is in the Ark of the Covenant was stolen by Moses, including the Ten Commandments. Once again, if you're new to the Great Awakening, Moses did not get the Ten Commandments from having some psychedelic experience with God on a mountain. He stole them from the Egyptian Book of the Dead. The Jews did not escape Egypt. They were asked to leave Egypt because 
Moses and his cronies did not escape Egypt. They were asked to leave Egypt because they were black sorcerers and they were doing a bunch of really bad shit to the Egyptians. It's all inverted, guys. It's all inverted. So whatever the Ark of the Covenant holds, it's, it's holding stolen stuff. Joseph Campbell writes that this staff was worshipped in every temple of Jerusalem, along with the image of its spouse, the mighty goddess, who was known there as Asherah. The ashram, you will remember, were the wooden steps or staffs or trees dedicated to the divine mother. This serpent staff was only removed from the Hebrew temple during the persecution of King Hezekiah around 700 BCE when the priests of Yahweh destroyed it. And again, Yahweh is another word for Moloch, not, not creator God, but Moloch. The corruption of wisdom that followed completely distorted their original meaning of both the serpent and the tree of life, both emblems linked to the goddess as a symbolic roadmap to the path of enlightenment. The priests of Yahweh then invented a story about it the evil nature of the serpent and the tree of knowledge, which caused the expulsion of Adam and Eve from the garden of paradise, blaming this fall from grace on women. This did think about it that way, guys, like Lucifer had us in a prison in the garden of Eden. Then we escaped. And what are the controllers trying to do now? They're trying to bring us back into a new world order, a, a prison state again. So interesting, isn't it? That the priest of Yahweh, the priest of Moloch, were the ones who started to invert that. Very interesting. This disorientation of the true meaning behind these sacred symbols represents a total inversion of the emblems of wisdom that were once a part of our spiritual heritage. Symbols that emerged from the healthier participating societies. The Lady of the Harvest. The Great Mother was also called the Mother of Plants and the Goddess of Vegetation. While men hunted for food, women searched for berries, herbs, seeds, and roots. Over time, these women began to plant their seeds, discovering the art of agriculture. The female invention based, this female invention based on generations of experimentation with seed cultivation, cutting and grafting and grain storage brought on the Neolithic revolution circa 10,000 BCE. In her book, When God is a Woman, Merlin Stone writes, here it was the women who showed themselves supreme. They were not only the bearers of children, but also the chief producers of food. By realizing that this was possible to cultivate as well as to gather, they had made the earth valuable and they became consequently its possessors. Thus, they won both economic and social power and prestige. Thus, the woman sparked the change from hunting and gathering tribes into agricultural societies that planted it and harvested their food. So something interesting Stephanie told me about dresses with pockets. So back in, you know, the days of yorn, if you were a woman and your dress had pockets, that meant you were a witch. Why did you have pockets? Because you were going out and cutting herbs and seeds. You put your herbs and seeds in there. Just interesting. In Neolithic cave paintings, we even see images of the goddess with a plant growing from her yoni, marking her as the generator of all growing things. Sorry, I had a really, really bad thought in my head with a garden growing from her hoo-ha, like, Girl, you just need to get you a razor. Like, <laughs> we all do that now. We all clean ourselves up. So um, just get you a razor, girl. It's good. It's all good. I mean, I'm completely like, I take everything off because I'm in yoga pants all the time. And so that to me is the cleanest. So girl, if, if you need help with that vegetation down there, we can help you out, sister. It's fine. Sister's got to help a sister out. Uh, men do that too, though. I know. I, I applaud men who do that as well. But, um, but women... Yeah. All right. Okay. Stone writes, the earliest agriculture must have grown up around the shrines of the mother goddess, which thus became social and economic centers as well as holy places and were the germs of future cities. As Isis was the lady of the harvest, the goddess who had brought the gift of wheat to humanity, just as the native American world, she was corn woman, the bringer of maize. So powerful were these acts of generosity that the goddess became immortalized as Virgo, the virgin whose astrological sign occurs in September. Yep. The month of harvesting wheat. Isis then became known as Dementor or Creus, the mother of Creels in Greece and Rome. Virgo, the queen, is depicted holding a staff of enlightenment in one hand and a bundle of wheat in the other, presiding over all physical, intellectual, and spiritual acts of regeneration. Later, Mary, the mother, would, 
would be given the month of September to celebrate her birthday, which according to the church falls on September 8th. The eternal triad. The great mother was seen as a triad of constantly evolving stages. Cycle, not linear, like nature itself. And I talked about that with the sun salutations, how we start our practice, right? Surya Namaskar A is very linear. Surya Namaskar B, we get the hips involved. It becomes very reciprocal. Surya Namaskar A is the masculine because it's linear. Surya Namaskar B is the feminine because it's reciprocal, right? The woman's body is reciprocal. It's not linear, right? Our hips come out. We have a, a waist. We got boobs. It's very reciprocal. Yeah. She ushers the soul into a higher phase of existence, blessing each day along the way. This includes life, death, and rebirth. The goddess encompasses all things within herself, yin and yang, masculine and feminine, light and dark. Her lunar phases represents the cycle of birth, light, and death, reflecting the three phases of a person's life, the maiden, the mother, and the matriarch, or the youth, the man, and the sage. Unlike the warrior god who stood outside creation, ordering the, and punishing, the mother was alive within her own creation, taking responsibility for the many cycles of life. She exists within the matrix, and all things are woven within her. She is not absent from the world, but alive within everything, in both seen and unseen dimensions. And these realms all share in the sanctity of the original source. Such an image helps us to honor the sacred in everything, fostering compassion and kindness to all. The Ascent of the Warrior Clans. Today's archaeologists tell us that the demise of the great goddess culture began in Turkey and Greece. Excavation in these regions are revealing much information about the Neolithic Aegeans, the earliest inhabited of the Greek peninsula. But there is still much that we do not know. But based on the artifacts we have uncovered, we know these cultures were martillennial, honored the yearly cycles, and maintained a partnership model of leadership between men and women. They thrived between 20, 2500 and 1600 BCE, a period we now call the Bronze Age. So what changed this idyll idyllic model of society? Archaeology tells us that some 3,600 years ago, a group of fierce warrior clans swept down into, into the Mediterranean from the north, bringing with them their brutal storm gods and violent weapons. There are several theories as to who these tribes were. Some believe they were Kurgan tribes from the south of Russia, known for their do domestication of the horse and their use of chariots. Others believe they were the warmongering Achaeans who swept in from the north and the south, flourishing between 1600 and 1150 BCE throughout the Mediterranean. These were the aggressive seafaring kings whose naval war wars inspired Homer to write the Iliad and the Odyssey. And I actually think the Iliad and the Odyssey are true stories at this point call me crazy but i i think i think those are true stories maybe during atlantean times i don't know others believe they were the somatic nomads who invaded egypt about 1800 bce this group threw egypt into chaos for hundreds of years but whoever these invaders were, they brought with them an oppressive superiority and patriarchal moors and crushed the more peaceful Agarian culture. These violent intruders raped and impregnated the women, slaughtered the men, and sent those who escaped scurrying for their lives. They imposed their own system of violent values and weakened the matrilineal traditions that had been passed from mother to child for thousands of years, beginning the destruction of all women's rights and the rise of patriarchal regimes of power. Towards the close of the Bronze Age, and more strongly in the dawn of the Iron Age, 1250 BCE in the Levant, the old cosmology and mythologies of the goddess mother were radically transformed, reinterpreted, and in large measure suppressed by those suddenly intrusive patriarchal warrior tribesmen whose traditions have come down to us chiefly in the Old and New Testament and in the myths and stories of Greek mythology. To extensive ge geographical territories where the source of lands of these insurgent warriors waves for the Semites, the Syro-Arabian deserts, where as raging nomads, they herded sheep and goats and later mastered the camel. And for the Hellenic, and for the Hellenic Aryan Kurgan martyrs, the broad plains of Europe and southern Russia, where they had raised their herds of cattle and early mastered the horse. And bearing in Joel's cash for authors of the myth of the goddess, evolution of an image, writes that the matriarchal practices of leadership, healing, and shamanism were suppressed by these invaders that sl and slowly the patriarchal one. 
Indo-European tribes in ever-increasing numbers forced their way into Mesopotamia, Antolia, and land stretching eastward into the Indus Valley. At the same time, Semitic tribes moved into Mesopotamia and Canaan from the Syria-Arabian desert. The descendants of the old Paleolithic hunters in their tribal homelands of the vast grassy steep norths of the Caspian and Black Sea have now become warriors and we can trace their paths of conquest as they appear as Hittites in Antolia and Samaria, Mitanni, Hurons, and Kassites in Mesopotamia, Achaeans, and then Dorians in Greece, the Aryans in the Indus Valley, wherever they penetrated, they established themselves as the ruling caste and their appearances is marked by a trail of devastation. In Antolia alone, some 300 cities were sacked, burned, among them Troy, and in this pattern, they repeated from Greece to the Indus Valley. The sky gods of these tribes lived on mountain tops and in clouds, hurling thunderbolts at those who would not obey them. They brought with them a sense of superiority, a deep sense of futility of life, the finality of death, and the fundamental conviction of human guilt. As one might imagine, these sky gods cultures preached a paradigm of oppression, conquest, and opposition in which the world of nature was instinctively separated from the spiritual realm of the gods. Yes, that, that's true. Attitude toward life and death were fundamentally altered as people experienced life as violent, unpredictable, and untrustworthy. People no longer felt safe in the countryside or in villages, but came to seek refuge in cities guarded by immense walls where they could be protected by warriors. An elite group of warriors sprang up, demoting farmers, artisans, and peasants to the level of serfs. Yeah, the military, I mean, yeah. The characters of both the culture and the mythology of gods and goddesses changed radically. Dominance in warfare infected societies with a barbaric ambitions of territorial rulers who had a compulsion to conquer and enslave other people. The killing of others became a sign of superiority and might became the measure of right. This model of society is radically different from the world of the goddess where moral order and responsibility are based on eternal sacredness of life. So we see that how might became the measure of right. We see this in the, even in the truther community guys where the mighty truthers are the ones who are right, even though most of them are infiltrators. Does might, does having so many followers mean that you're right? No, because what is popular is not always right. And what is right is not always popular. Might does not equal right. Early humans didn't see themselves as separate from nature and other beings. There is no sense of hierarchy or caste operating in the early epochs. No sign of slavery or inequality. The changeover that marks the beginning of Western culture 5,000 years ago was a lethal separation from nature and the body in favor of dominate, dominating of, of the ego over everything. Yeah. Again, we see that with a lot of truthers. The bigger the ego, the more corrupt they seem to be. Might does not equal right. Where the goddess has been venerated as the giver and supporter of life as well as consumer of the dead, women as her represent representatives have been according to the paramount position in society as well as in cult. Such an order of female-dominated social and cultic customs is terminated. In a broad and general way, the order of mother right and opposed to such without quarter in the order of the patriarchy with an ardor of righteousness, eloquence, and fury of fire and sword. <laughs> Many scholars now believe that the later theatrical dramas of the ancient Greeks, such as Electra and Orestes, all reflect this transition from a loving mother-son relationship to one of murder, betrayal, and social demotion. These Greek tragedies all center around a son who either kills his mother or engages in sexual relations with her and then finds that his life has been ruined. This is a direct reversal of the earlier sister-brother, mother-son harmonious rulership models found across Mediterranean where men and women lived together peacefully with one another. The goddess was the loving mother of her hero son, 
or she was his wife or maid. And together they gave birth to the holy daughter. It was this union that made the bounty for the land. Examples of this partnership model can be found in the stories of I of Isis and Horus in Egypt, Ishtar and Tammuz in the Levant and Cybele and Addis and Rome's and Sita and Rama and in India. Broken into pieces. As the powers of the goddess, we, uh, before we get into this, we talked about this in Aquarius Rising Africa. So a lot of these old stories, like Isis and Osiris were not siblings. They weren't. They want to tell you they were because they want to invert the story for their own gains. And we see they weren't siblings by the depictions of them. Isis and Osiris are depicted as two different races. I'm white. If I had a black brother, then that means my dad isn't that guy's dad, right? Like if you were black, and your wife is white, or you're white, you don't come from the same people. So what I think these stories were depicting were twin flames. They had the same soul. But biologically, they were not the same. Genetically, they were not the same. Okay? And Stephanie, I've talked about this, and I think that's their inversion. of the, We know they're trying to keep twin flames apart. We know that's what they're doing, right? I know quite a few twin flames who are drastically being held apart right now by this, this cult, this cabal. They're inverting that. And they invert that with um, incest too. Your twin flame is not going to be your sibling. It's just not. Even nature knows not to mate with its siblings. Like when I rescue dogs in India, like Robbie is from India. And the vet I work with in India, it's very fascinating to see how these street dogs work. They know who their siblings are. They will not mate with their sisters. So the matings, they only mate once a year. So if Ravi were on the streets of India and he was born into a litter with all, he was the only boy, you know, little girl puppies. And then they all got rescued and adopted out. Um, Ravi went, which boys laugh because you can tell he had a bunch of sisters. <laughs> um, he would know not to mate with his sisters. The dogs will leave their pack and go to a neighboring pack to mate with a neighboring dog and then go back to their pack. So even in nature, even nature understands that fundamentally that you don't mate with your sibling, with someone you're related to. It's just us that inverted that with the, these controllers and they inverted these stories too, which these stories, they were not siblings. They weren't. They were twin flames. All right, now we're going to get into broken into pieces. As the power of the goddesses waned, so did the rights of women. Where women once had right to own property, transact business, and inherit property from their families on equal terms with men, after 2300 BCE, the status of women slowly deteriorated. In north of Sumeria, which later became known as Babylon, the Semitic tribes regarded women as merely the possession of men. Fathers and husbands claimed the power of life and death over daughters and wives. Sons inherited from their fathers, whereas daughters inherited nothing and could be sold into slavery by their fathers and brothers. The birth of a son was hailed as a blessing while a daughter could be exposed to die. These changes in attitude about the importance of women and their understanding of the universe also caused fundamental changes in the way people looked at life and death. Death became regarded as the absolute end of life something dark and terrifying to be feared. The ancient knowledge of rebirth went underground and the cycles of divine order were lost. In the male-oriented myths, all that was good and noble was attributed to the new heroic gods of war and the dark, mysterious powers of nature were left to women. The mother goddess, once venerated as the giver of life and the welcomer of death, was thrown down. The circle of life was broken and people no longer understood that the womb and the tomb were all part of the natural cycles of life. In addition, the material realm became the only realm of importance. As we disconnected from our understanding of how the unmanifested realms of spirit helped to generate this world, nature was now something to be dominated, conquered, and harnessed. Trees and animals had no essential value except as timber or food. Man became the sole determiner of everyone's life and it was all in service to him. 
Over the next 2,000 years, the goddess would be slowly dismembered by the patriarchy, shattered like a beautiful vase that had been broken into pieces. For the goddess that remained, one aspect of her nature would be pitted against another. Aphrodite, the goddess of sexual love, was pitted against Hera, the married queen of heaven, vying for the attention of a male. Athena, the goddess of wise civilization, was now at odds with Aphrodite, the goddess of love, fighting over the city of Troy. In time, with the rise of the Abrahamic religions, the great mother was either totally extinguished or spit further into pieces. In Christianity, she became the good mother or the lady of sexual pleasures, but she was never allowed to be both, confusing both men and women alike. This polarity is exactly what we find in the stories of the obedient Virgin Mary and the penitent Mary Magdalene. As Jennifer and Roger Wolger write in the book, The Goddess Within, each of the, departmented, each of the departmental goddesses is now cut off from the original mother, and they are from this point onward divided against themselves. Here, very dramatically, in this historical origin of the deepest aspect of the goddess's wombs. Once the fracturing of the goddess began as the patriarchy came to control most of the world, the continuing of life itself was broken, and with it our sacred connection to Mother Nature. Then beneath the negative projections of Hebrew, Muslim, and Christian archetypes, these pieces became further divided. It seemed that each woman had to choose between being a, an obedient wife, a virginal maiden, a self-sacrificing mother, or a woman of ill repute. If a woman was too independent in her thinking, she was cast as Eve, the disobedient wife. If she re rebelled against male authority, she was turned into Lilith, the first wife of Adam, who refused to obey her husband's sexual commands. So strenuous was this condemnation of women that in the Dark Ages, Lilith was cast as Satan. Never mind that these fables of man's divine right to rule were fabricated by patriarchal men during the construction of the Old Testament documents around 500 BCE. While perverting the symbols of the feminine face of the divine, they cut down her forest, leveled her sacred trees, and demonized those aspects of the mother's love that they could not eradicate. And by justifying their suppression of women as the will of God, they had made half of the world's population subservient to the other half. Finally, the patriarchy turned the wise herbalists into the weathering hag, transforming grandmothers into symbols of evil. Hag, by the way, derives from the root word meaning holy woman or sacred grove, revealing the deeper links of this currently pejorative word to the healing priestess of old. But in the Middle Ages, the patriarchal interpretation of the wise woman was abandoned and the elderly woman lost the grace of male protection since she was no longer useful to a man's political or sexual agendas. If her husband or sons were killed in war, she had no one to speak for her. She was turned out of her house and her only resource was to take refuge in the woods where the church depicted her as a good for nothing but gathering sticks. In Europe, the one bastion of influence that older women still retained was that of the midwife or healer. Her understanding of plants had come down from her ancestors, but with the rise of the male dominated church, even the medicine women were replaced by the all knowing male doctors. Thus the wise woman was persecuted for her gifts of herbal wisdom and turned into the witch for over a thousand years. She became the target of fear suspicion and torture accused of causing the deaths of those who sought she sought to save and the most brutal errors of the inquisition there were somewhere between five million and nine million women put to death by the church for the crime of being attuned to the natural energies of the earth never again would the goddess be allowed to reign as the great mother she was erased as the queen of heaven and the creatics who had birthed the universe Jungian psychologist james hillman says that in the creating this extreme polarization between a negative, condemning, judgmental God and a banished loving mother, we have actually denied ourselves a healthy spiritual life. Some historians have even linked this to the fracture of a horrible divorce. The male and female aspects of ourself no longer speak to one another. Humanity as the poor child is left destitute with only an angry father as a parent. He forbids the children to speak of their loving mother and tells them that she must be banished as if she has never been. 
by worshiping the father principle alone and suppressing or belittling the feminine, we have done some serious damage to our individual and collective psychic health. And this is to say nothing of the planet Earth. These wombs have been sustained for over 3,000 years in a battle waged by the patriarchal over the feminine. Roger and Jennifer will observe. With only a father to guide us, despite his love, we have become hardened, relentlessly heroic, and grimly punitive in our efforts to forget the lost security and sensual trust in the earth the mother once gave us. Long ago, we dimly sense there was a primordial unity when a mother earth and a spirit father enjoyed a happy and harmonious union. But the paradise is lost. In our estrangement, we have been forced to swallow the embedded propaganda of a guilty yet all-powerful father. Cultural superiority. While today's modern religions congratulate themselves on outgrowing the polytheism of our childish past and graduating into more mature monotheism, in truth, by refusing to acknowledge the divine spark in everything around us, we cripple our ability to relate to the divine in all of its forms. We close our eyes to the visible and invisible expressions of God. We close our hearing to the music of the trees, the spirits of the animals, and our ability to dream with the intelligence of the stars. From the dominance of the warrior Aryans to the machismo of the Greeks, the imperialism of Rome, and the guilt-ridden excess of the puritanical repression, the spirit of the divine feminine has been dishonored, manipulated, mistreated, and suppressed. And it is only now in this time in this century that our civilization is beginning to question what exactly has thrown us out of balance? Restoring the feminine to its rightful place in partnership with the masculine, with both as true equals, is the most important step we can take today if we are ever going to claim our place as caretakers of this planet and take our next step as enlightened human beings. <laughs>